just I'm just reassimilating to life and sleep and yeah, yeah, all yeah. of that. So was it more like sleep deprived when you were in the retreat? No, but it's you know I wouldn't say you're getting like a ton of like truly restful sleep. I mean right, you have right. like your own private cabin and stuff, but it's um yeah it's just very hard on the body and mind and right yeah. spirit you know it's just three days in a row just like, da, 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 da. so but, yeah you want to open Here we yeah are. i'll open so uh welcome to the show uh to floridian uh thanks for tuning in we can see your comments on twitch and i can kind of see them if i look around yeah, on Twitch, I can see the comments right there on the screen. Um, and I can kind of see them when I look around on uh, Facebook and YouTube, uh, but I got to look around, so it might take time. Uh, so if you want to say something with us, we're there. Uh, but we're talking with Kurt Rogers, uh, as promised, um, who has started multiple projects here in Jacksonville in Florida, and he's going to talk to us about the process and the journey uh, that went along with starting up those projects and where uh, he's at now and what's coming in the future. Um, we're here with Alexandra Nee, uh, who joins us now each week, thankfully, <laughs> to add a bit more depth and character to uh, uh, my uh, interview process and to the show. You have her to thank for the uh, upgrade of the environment <laughs> on the show. You're welcome. Um, so Kurt is uh, lucky enough. I'm lucky enough to have him come back after we tried to do the show already once, but I messed up the audio uh, early <laughs> on. It's all good. Happy to be back. It so. was meant not to be aired. Yeah, we're, we're going to do a much more clear, I think, a clearer and better <laughs> show now. So. So thank you for coming back, Kurt. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Of course. And um, and I'm I'm thankful as well for you to share uh, your your journey really with us. Um, maybe I can kick it off by starting with where we met, um, a story you you've heard yeah. me tell before. But for, sure. uh, for uh, posterity and as a good beginning, we can start at the beginning. I ran into you in Amsterdam, yeah. and uh, in a coffee shop, which is where they sell marijuana there. And um, uh, I heard you, uh, overheard you talking, and I, I recognized that you were from Jacksonville. And, and uh, that kicked off a, a conversation about a bar that you were starting, I believe, uh, and, or, yeah. or about bars in general. Yeah, yeah about, about bars. About the layout of bars. And... Um, Jesus, that was... I don't even know how long ago that was. Yeah, was that like 20 was, years ago? Oh, or, or, no, 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 really? no. It was maybe like 2010, 2012. That's, yeah, that sounds yeah. about right. Yeah, because yeah. you moved to Berlin okay. like late 12, 2012. Okay, so like 10 years ago? Yeah, 10, 10, 12 years ago. But haven't we been back here for 10 years? Yeah, but it, you lived very... Anyway, you lived so little in Berlin, and I presume you met... Kurt, oh, so it was shortly before that. Yeah. I got you. Yeah. I don't know. I, I wasn't there. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I was already. I'm just piecing the timeline. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I yeah. think of, like you're flat, like you were up on like top of a building mm -hmm. somewhere. Like always, though, in Amsterdam. Yeah. That's yeah. every apartment I had. But it was all behind, you know, like the big diamond shop or whatever with the. Uh, you know, yeah. It was like down that road. I guess it would have been like. Yeah, I was upstairs the... from the greenhouse coffee shop right right, right. Yeah. yeah yeah that was the one i had for the longest right and then i think you moved to like the other side of the city and then moved to berlin mm -hmm. okay. that's right okay. yeah. yeah that's right yeah so yeah we met there and um and you had just we discussed a bar and then you uh when i came back to jacksonville you had opened up sidecar right, right? yeah i mean i think when we met i was probably still at flies tie and, then, and, and black sheep no? no well that was later after mm. flies tie i had shifted over to restaurant orse i was working with them and of course they opened up black sheep which was great um you know so i was there for about two and a half years i think with that restaurant group and then a good friend of mine matt carson who was a regular of mine at flies tie had moved away and was moving back when we were opening black sheep so i was like yeah you know he hit me up i was like we're opening this place come work with us um and then he had found some investors and we left there and opened sidecar, sidecar. together yeah i was with sidecar for about nine years i guess I and mean, it took about a year or so to make and then when i left i think they were it was like eight and a half years in or so 
That's a long run. Years. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's still going strong. They just did some really nice renovations. I don't know if you've been in there recently. But no, the one in San Marco? It looks completely different. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they like extended the bar and enclosed oh, the cow. patio. So yeah. it's like all AC'd and built a nice deck out front. But yeah, it looks really nice. So, so for those of you who may not be in Jacksonville, uh, Sidecar is a. Uh, an upscale um, um, cocktail bar, cocktail lounge, adjacent to a very nice pizza place, probably the best pizza in the city, and um, the, for cocktails as well. It's one of the best places in the city to go for craft cocktails. So it's a, and it has a simple and discreet layout, I would say, uh, in that it's open. It's not uh, complicated. But in this process, it makes it where you can really mix with people and you sit at a large mm -hmm. communal table often. And uh, this makes it to where you really can uh, be open and talk with a lot of people. Yeah. I, I think in the Europe and well, outside the US, what they call this kind of bar, long, like uh, land and a very long bar, bar counter, they actually call it American, like American bar. Cause I ha yeah, because I have friends in um, in Saint Petersburg, Russia, and they were open in. They first opened in Saint Petersburg, a couple of locations, and they opened in Berlin. And were, and when the, the Berlin location was in in um, concept, they were always referring it as an American style. bar style. Yeah, bar. this is your friend that opened the Hat, right? Yeah, the Hat, yeah, about, yeah, the Jam Session. Bar, quite a yeah. quite a nice, successful international bar. And it makes sense. Yes, yeah. sometimes I think cool. American bars don't even have like seats, right? Because it's almost like those coffee places in Italy where people just come in straight to the counter. Right? Yeah, yeah, espresso, and they don't need to sit down. <laughs> but I don't know. I, I'm not. Yeah. When we were open in Sidecar, I mean, that was a, a big, ins you know, a inspiration was communal seating, and it was like, especially like on the patio. You mm -hmm. know, it's like we wanted people. I was like, just put your fucking phone down, turn the TV off, sit next to somebody you don't know, strike up a conversation. You know, I felt like that was very, like, kind of pulled from, like, some of the Dutch beer, mm, you know, mm -hmm. places and the German beer halls where you just go and it's just big, long tables and you just sit down. I mean, there's been plenty of times where I've been at a beer hall in Germany and just sat down at a table, and before, you know, there's 20 people around you don't know. And then two hours later, you're dancing on the table with strangers <laughs> and kicking over pretzels and, you know, having a good time. So, I um, the pretzels. It's a. Uh... I've never had a better time in a beer hall than I've had in Amsterdam. It is crazy, the beer hall scene. Mm. They have a whole beer hall scene, I would say, and the whole group will sing and dance at once, and the whole place will rock back and forth with these songs. I guess you need to know those songs and dance. There's a great bar. I, it's, I couldn't even tell you the name of it. I could take you there, but it's like on the, like a, uh, I guess like the south end like the top of the red light district and they do like sunday jazz and it's like a free-for-all so it's like you go in oh yeah i know the blues brothers and you're drinking no 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 it's it has a very dutch name it's like cafe and something but it's like it'll start with three people and before you know it there's like 17 guys just free styling jazz you know and everybody's just drinking beer and having yeah. a good time and it's interesting. Like, this is crazy. Because you never think of jazz and beer in kind of like one. Yeah, but the jazz and the Dutch go really, 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 really well together. <laughs> yeah. They also love jazz the, and have yeah. made some great jazz too. musicians, you know. So it's uh... Berlin has the new standard jam session that I was very lucky to get to play um, electro swing for downstairs in like nice. a lounge. And uh, upstairs, they had uh, this free form jam session where people would come from all over Europe and just play in this very hot smoky room oh, and it was they're all hot and smoky oh yeah, yeah. and it was jam packed there was yeah. never ever a place to sit or even be you had to just squeeze in wherever mm -hmm. you could That's fit great. in and it was so cool the oh, the music was amazing every single time mm. hell yeah that's great. So you uh, came, uh, you, you were, we, I came back to Jacksonville. You had been, you were visiting Amsterdam. You weren't right. living there. Uh, but you came and started a, 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 your sidecar. own you know, sidecar, your own business out of, I presume, what you had amassed from your experience working with uh, Orsay, working with Black Sheep, 
working with these, you know, various service industry jobs. And then you applied it again in Bar Molino. Is that, am I up to date here? Yeah. So Sidecar was definitely, uh, you know, an uh, amalgamation of, you know, myself and and my old business partner, good friend, Matt Carson. Um, you know, when we were talking about opening a bar together, we kind of, you know, you have dreams and write things down mm -hmm. you have a notebook and whatever and so we like literally sat down to talk about it we're comparing notes and we were like holy shit like we kind of want to open the same place like this is going to be easy like we you know it's like yeah they don't really have to change much you know and uh so that's how sidecar was born it was just kind of you know and you know we were all there it was you know we said from the very beginning like we want to set the standard for the city as far as cocktails go um, so we were always striving to just be the best that we could possibly be, you know? Um, yeah. So I was with them for a good long run and, uh, mm -hmm. and now, you know, I left there. Jeez. And, and you've got that knowledge of cocktails beyond the city. Then if you want to set the standard for the city, it was in your travels around and what you learned here. Of course. Yeah. I mean, what I learned here, obviously travels like, you know, I met people who know you in bars all over the world. A big part of my life, you know, it's funny when people travel like, oh, I'm going here. I'm like, hey, you got to go see my friend. They work at this bar. They own this place, you know, and they're just like, Jesus. I remember my dad and I were in Europe in 2019 and uh, like we were in Amsterdam. We were in Germany visiting some family and then we were in Spain, you know, we went down to southern Spain and then we were up in Barcelona and he was like, is there anywhere that we can go that you don't know somebody? And I was just like, I don't know. Like the, the bar community is as big as it is. And as global as it is, I feel like is so like tied together mm -hmm. and like, you know, so small, hmm. um, that it's great that it's like, if you don't know somebody, you know, somebody, you know, somebody, and then like, you're kind of instantly family, you know, yeah, which is, yeah. which is great. You know, I mean, it's, but that's hospitality is like, you know, welcoming with open arms like that's how it should always be so you know when you're traveling i mean that's the thing about bars and pubs right they've always been like safe places for travelers mm -hmm. you know so i mean that was the whole fucking yeah. point right you know it's like public house it typically had a couple of rooms attached to it so you know i don't think that that's changed and you know hopefully that will never change like they should always be safe places for mm -hmm. travelers to go and meet other people and hang out and I mean, what's the, if you're in some place new, what's the best way to get the lay of the land? You find a local, you go and sit at the bar, you talk to the bartender, be like, what's the fucking score here, right? What's the best <laughs> burger? What's the best jazz? What's the best whatever? Uh -huh. And they're going to know. And if they don't know, they're, you know, they're going to call somebody who does. Right. And, and, you know, now you have a little kind of network in the, in the town that you're visiting. And so, mm -hmm. so what uh, initially brought you into this industry? Just coincidence, creativity of being a, like a mixologist or the hospitality? It's all started in the back of the house from a very young age. I wanted to work in kitchens uh -huh. and like, like I wanted to be a chef. And I remember sitting at like my great grandmother's house in St. Petersburg, Florida talking with my grandmother and it was weird because i was just thinking about this conversation the other day and she was asking me what i wanted to be when i grow up and i was like i want to own a restaurant and i was probably seven nine maybe i don't know yeah. and uh this is before they were famous on tv you know, right <laughs> yeah and uh and that so that's what i've always kind of wanted to do and i've dabbled in other things but like i've always been brought back to the restaurant industry and I started in it when I was 15 you know I'm gonna be 45 in a month and it's like so it's yeah 30 years wow. of hospitality yeah. and and uh yeah so I was like working in different kitchens and stuff and then took a job as a waiter and I was like this is great because I get to work with all sorts of people mm -hmm. you know the general public and and whatnot and the money was way better so you know as a young person i was like this is fucking fantastic mm -hmm. um and then i remember like i was taking my first serving job at the sun dog diner in neptune beach i remember that place. Oh, god it was great and i was getting off i had worked like a long shift like lunch and dinner and i was getting off and 
the bar it was like a friday night it was packed you know they always had live music that place would like rip on the weekends and uh someone from behind the bar was like hey our bar back didn't show up i know you've been here all day like can you do us a solid and i was like yeah fuck it you know so okay <laughs> i was like i have no idea what i'm doing i don't know where anything goes i've never stepped foot behind a bar and uh so i got back there and it was so chaotic in like the most beautiful way and i was just like this is fucking rad and they're like screaming at me like do this do this and i'm like putting glasses in the wrong place and you know i have no idea what's going on and one of the bartenders just looks at me and goes i need six margaritas and i'm like i don't know what the fuck that is like i don't know how to make that and so he's like talking me through it you know and i was just like this is it this is what i want to do this is you know oh. this is amazing so what was amazing being like well the creativity the rush adrenaline i guess well back or... then there was no creativity there was no craft cocktail was bars like, there were, you know it was just yeah it was single mixers shots you know i mean that was we were coming out of the you know this was the early 2000s so i mean it was still like very 90s style drinks you know b-52s and melon balls and you just like yeah. being like dr octopus just yeah, just yeah. Stuff on it. <laughs> right yeah and it's like you know on the floor like you're covering uh -huh. i went through a phase like you, this you have to like run around and there's so much but behind the bar you're like in a cockpit you don't really have to go anywhere you, yeah. know, you have everything that you need and yeah. you're just like and again you know the people are coming to you and it's just you know and it's just more lively you know the, mm. the experience even if it's the same room mm-hmm and the experience at a table is very much very much different than the experience at a bar right so mm -hmm. um and it's uh you know i mean even at bar molino like you know, i would talk with this with my general manager all the time i was like you know who comes from a, a serving background he's worked michelin star you mm -hmm. know experience so he, he has you know fantastic serving experience but i was like our service is very different you know so um you know, people who come and sit at the bar are looking for a different type of experience. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's better. what I liked as a DJ. And so I think it's right. a similar thing. You like people come and you, you craft something, you're changing something to tune to a crowd that you're seeing. And then when more people start dancing or people respond to that music, well, you're, you are like, this is awesome. I'm having a conversation. Basically I'm communicating with all these people. And when you have a bar, when you're bartending, it's a, I think it's similar, right? You, yeah. You're, you're having a communication with a whole room of people and you see right. how that room changes mm. based on your yeah you know. and everybody wants a different experience as well you know but then as we moved into like you know the craft cocktail scene and stuff yeah be, very much a lot of it became about the creativity which mm -hmm. tapped back into me wanting to like be a chef when i was younger you know because it's the same thing it's mm -hmm. taking a base flavor whether that's gin or red meat and then building on that mm -hmm. until you have a completed dish or a completed drink. It's the same thing, you know. Um, what so. is uh, what is your most favorite and most popular cocktail that you yourself created? Oh. I know you don't drink now, but maybe off the memory. I mean, the one that will probably go down, like it'll be on my fucking tombstone, is the, <laughs> the Dusty Boot from black sheep oh my goodness yeah we so even called our cat is Dusty your Boot. creation yeah and it was ah. it was the very first cocktail we drank so many of those. i ever made for their very first menu and it like was i think was on every menu until they closed and it was literally nothing but like a whiskey sour with bitters and like a smoked sea salt rim i mean it was like yeah the simplest thing you know but it was like it was i was still good, learning though. you know cocktails and stuff so it's like so um, it's but it was very good because it was always it was always good and to be blunt the the bar at, at, it would fluctuate it would be at black sheep it was really good sometimes and then every now and then it just would be not so good at yeah, all which is weird because there's a recipe so it should be the same it should every be every single yeah. time but it, it happens when you i think ha, don't have consistent help you'll have amazing people at right, the bar sure. kicking out awesome drinks and then you get people who become accustomed to that and they come and they're like ah no this is horrible and then another time ah horrible and then they just stop ordering that drink right but dusty boot they always got right 
So I ordered the Dusty Boot all the time because it was consistently good no matter who made it. People could make it well every single time, and it was always a good drink. I mean, it's one of those cocktails that's like, I think people would ask for it at other bars. Like, I mean, we would get mm-hmm. asked for that's it at right. Stodcar all the time. They wouldn't even know that, yeah, like, I, I know. created the drink, you know, and they're like, just that black sheep. I had this amazing cocktail. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, tell me about it. And they're like, this had smoked sea salt. I was like, I got you. No problem. <laughs> it was the smoked sea salt, though, that definitely made it uh, unique. Well, yeah. I wonder if it's something that is familiar. So it's already endearing. If you say it's mm-hmm. like basically like uh, whiskey sour. Yeah. But then you add that very kind of unusual and unexpected element that. I, mean, I think we're up. I think we're in a very whiskey town. So, oh, really? So you think Jackson was a whiskey town? Yeah, for sure. Okay. For sure. And like a lot of things, I think the name helps. The name is kind of unimposing and cool. Yeah, shout out boot. to my manager at Orsay, Jason Eddy, for that. Because uh, I remember I was like, taste this for me. I was like, I'm having a hard time coming up with a name. And he's like, kind of tastes like a dusty boot. You know, and I was just like, <laughs> great. That's what we're going to fucking call it. Nice. <laughs> and uh, so I don't know if he remembers that, but. Yeah, it's like one of those memories that I'll just never forget. So, um, what what made you move from uh, uh, from sidecar to Bar Molino? You had a new concept and you decided you wanted to do it. Was it just the idea alone, or there's always been a version of Bar Molino in my head? I think, um, and as I was getting older, my taste in what I was drinking was changing. So mm-hmm. you know, and. You know, I've always had an affinity for wine, but it's always been Spanish wine. You know, not that I turn my nose up at French or Italian or American mm-hmm. or German or whatever. Um, but I've always loved Spanish wine. So there's always been some version of, you know, Bar Molino in my head. So, um, you know, met a gentleman, uh, Alfred Young, who um, wanted to invest in the idea and... So we sat down and kind of put pen to paper and sketched out this concept. And uh, yeah, Bar Molino was kind of born and it was, I I think it fills a niche that the city doesn't have, you know, I mean, there's no like, you know, um, there's not a lot of top of bars around. Um, No, like nobody solely focusing on like Spanish wine. I mean, we've got over probably 200 something labels of Spanish wine rotates, you know, quite often. And when we first opened, we were strictly beer and wine. So all of our cocktails were sherry based. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, now we have a full liquor license. So that's, you know, that's changed our cocktail program quite a bit, but that is new. I did not know that. Yeah. I think we got it back in late November. Put the and we're, but then started putting the program together because it takes a little bit of time. Right, right. Um, and then we shut down for the first week of January. We like refinished the tables and moved some things around. And you know, chef was working on a new food menu. Of course, we were implementing the mm. the cocktail program. Right. So then, when we opened on the ninth, we kind of had a new food menu, new drink menu, and whatnot. So, but it's going really well. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, you know, Spanish wine has always been, you know, uh, I don't know. I just always loved it. And, you know, so that kicked off a love for when I mean, you find, you fall in love with the country's wine, you're eventually going to start eating the food that goes with it, you know? And then it's like, well, where's this food come from? So I guess I'll go to fucking Spain, you know, <laughs> twist my arm. And uh, <laughs> so your trips to Spain inspired you for the concept, and then you wanted to bring that that flavor. Well, the concept. It, it, I mean, I don't know what came first, the chicken or the egg, but like I said, there's always been because yeah, the know, concept inspired you to go there, probably. Right, right. Yeah. You know. But then it was like going only adds fuel to the fire, and mm-hmm. so it was just like this never-ending cycle. But, mm. You know. You know, everybody's like, well, how come you, you know, are you going to focus on it? Are you going to be like a Basque restaurant? Are you going to be like a Galician restaurant or, you know, focus more on like, you know, Catalonia or Andalusia? And I'm like, Mm. no, I'm like, Spain is massive. It's the third largest country in Europe. It has 17 like autonomous communities and they're all vastly different. Even inside of each, you know, autonomous community is 
varies so greatly from town to town, city to city. I'm like, why would you pigeonhole yourself? I mean, you can just pick and choose from this massively beautiful array of mm -hmm. cuisine, you know? So that's what we do. Yeah. And I think for our town, it would be too specific. It was just like Basque country tapa style bar. I don't know. I'm like, I would not be able to like, oh, this is just... Well, I mean, maybe, I don't know. It I mean, depends. it's like yeah, a lot of people, you know, a lot of, yeah, a lot of people know, are familiar with the, you know, when they travel to Spain, there's like a handful of places that they're going. They're going to Barcelona, they're going right. to San Sebastian, they're going to Madrid. Yeah, maybe somewhere in Galicia, they're going to Valencia, right? Sevilla. Mm -hmm. But it's like Spain's so much more than that. Yes, right, those cities right. are great, fantastic. Sevilla is one of my favorite places like in the world, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, it's just so massive. So, so I think it's our job to continuously educate people on the rest of Spain as well, you know? Yeah. So do you feel like you have to, or your staff have to um, educate the customers on a regular basis in terms of what it is? Because I know your menus even uh, like maintain, well, keeps a lot of Spanish words, like original names right. for the... Yeah, I mean, there's there's some of that. There's always going to be some of that, no matter oh, what. I've had to ask on your menu yeah. what certain things are. Yeah, with no matter, I think no matter what you're doing, you know, you're going to have to have some sort of education, you know. So we try to prepare our, our co-workers the best that we can to, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, be as well-equipped as they possibly can. Um, and... You know, and that way it just makes it, you know, it puts the guest at ease. You know, I think the more well equipped your your server is to answer any questions, um, makes the guest feel a little more comfortable and provides a bit of trust there, right? So we have to mm -hmm. build that relationship. Like every every guest that comes in, every interaction is building a relationship with that mm -hmm. person or with that table, whoever the host of the party is or whatnot. So do you look for things in this context that you can say you, you, you would bring that might be novel or new um, in order to kind of, um, I'd say, expand that palette? I mean, yeah, I mean, that's I think that's always the goal is try to be innovative, try to be, you know, keep things as fresh as you can. But we're super limited on what's imported into the United States. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, I actually wanted to ask you about sourcing. That must be a it can challenge. be yes, it can be a giant challenge, you know. Um because of consistency? No, just because of like availability. the availability. Right. Sure. It's like I mean you just can't get everything that you possibly need, you know. So you have to make substitutions and people sometimes are like, This isn't authentically Spanish. I'm like, Well then tell me where to get <laughs> what i fucking I like need and i'll get it you know but trust me i have like reached out to the fucking consulate and you know like it's not that i haven't exhausted my resources as to you did know did you really reach out to yeah them? yeah i mean it's, it's not for a lack what of, did they say you know i mean they try to put me in contact with different importers and stuff like that the uh, best that, that what do you know about put. illegal food sourcing you know um i used to know a guy who did he'd bring it in on a on a ship and he had like the craziest things in spain was one of the places he would get things from right. he said chefs need some of this stuff and you can't get it it's he said he used to smuggle in drugs he said but it was so high risk he goes now i smuggle food yeah you and he would smuggle. You're like, oh, i didn't know i could bring that in yeah exactly yeah. he's like oops oh so it's illegal food yeah yeah oh it's food that food doesn't well, it doesn't have a tax stamp okay okay so it's not by the ingredient content no i mean you can't bring just... cheese back yeah you can't bring on pasteurized bring cheese, food you can't chocolate. bring yeah it's I like bring even, all the time. even certain like cured oh, meats. oh my goodness <laughs> you just told everybody the cops are coming even certain they're gonna take our chocolate i don't even eat tea, tea, uh, cheese yeah i didn't know that okay mm. so you cannot bring well this you know because you have to file that declaration yeah, you as can't you bring like any it. fruit right right, right. anything that you know? can be like sprouted right. in disease or, right yeah right. yeah that makes sense okay yeah you know, when you're in customs like most of the dogs you see walking around are like they're there at sniffing for food i, I always yeah. thought they were trying to find drugs and just failing yeah no it's just, <laughs> they're just bad at it yeah no, they just they want to find you know your apple 
or <laughs> your your weird exotic fruit that we don't grow here. Everybody manages to show up wherever with their vape pen, but there's all those dogs everywhere. The dogs are just like on our side. They're just yeah. like, it's cool, bro. Yeah, you got this. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, thanks, buddy. They really are man's best friend. They're like, I just wanted the training. You know, I didn't really want to hurt anybody. It's the cake job. So, <laughs> Excuse me. Since you added the liquor license, did you notice if anything shifted in terms of your clientele, in terms of like the are they more interaction drunk? or energy? No, no. I think the energy is the same. You know. Um, you know, the bar can get a little lively, you know, for a show with jackrabbits or something. But um, I wouldn't say, you know, it hasn't like, I don't think it's, there's been like a huge detrimental shift, you know. Oh, so, I didn't necessarily mean it in detrimental or negative yeah. sense. Just like it could be just a different quality of um, interaction. And No, I, I think it's 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 roughly pretty the Pretty much the same clientele. You know, pretty the much the same, same clientele. I think we're seeing. Now uh, they just can have cocktails. A bit more volume at the bar, you know, because... You have some people who just don't drink well, beer or wine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and they may only drink spirit. So then that will like hold them from coming in. So I think we're seeing like, you know, a slight influx of new guests, which is great. Yeah, that was yeah, me for decades. Want, you know? mm -hmm. About a year ago, I started just drinking a beer. Yeah. And just one, maybe two. And that's it. I just don't drink like I used to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Same. Mm -hmm. well, you, you quit drinking altogether. Yeah, six months. Uh, oh, Six oh, months has yeah. passed Friday. Mm -hmm. Was there any yeah. event that kind of inspired um, you? or? Yeah, I mean, it all kind of kicked off with, like, working with plant medicines. And I was preparing for a, a three-day, like, ayahuasca retreat mm -hmm. um, last September. So, like, right after my wife's birthday um, in August... I had stopped drinking just for, because I needed to prepare for this, mm -hmm. you know, this thing. Um, and how long before and it's about a month, ayahuasca right? do you have to stay off alcohol? I thought it's about a month. Yeah, they asked about, you know, a couple of weeks. Um, oh, okay. But, you know, I, so I started about a month before. Mm -hmm. And then when I came back, I just kind of really had no urge to continue drinking. And I just looked at it as like, this 30 year relationship with alcohol that um, isn't really serving me, I think in the way that I thought that it used to. So, so what was the main attraction before to the relationship with alcohol? The way it made you feel the taste, because you said you'll really appreciate it. Culture. I think it's, yeah, I think it's when you're young, it's, you know, a way to, interact socially it's you know you enjoy it you you know you like the party you, i mean i think there's a lot of things i don't think it's ever one thing right yeah you know um but it's you know but then it gets you know it can get out of hand and out of control and it leads to you right. know can lead to the use of other things which it definitely did in you know my scenario so it's nice to be able to like you know take a step back from all of that and it's um so yeah i just needed to reevaluate you know that relationship and it's Dude. the longest relationship i've ever been in so it's you know in 30 years is a long time it is interesting when you consider how many drinks you've drank or how much you've spent on alcohol yeah. have yeah. you ever done some basic math on how much you've spent on alcohol uh, yeah, so I have a I have an app that tracks, like you know, my sobriety, and I just put in like, they're like, just put in a number of like. You put in like spend. what you used to drink. You know, so I'm like, if you say thirty five dollars a day, right, which is not much if you're going out to a cocktail bar, it's like no. two or three drinks in mm -hmm. tip, right? So I mean, six months you're over, you're at like seven grand. Mm. Oh, really? Months. Yeah, thirty five. Oh, a day yeah is uh wow mm. no wonder our last trip was so much less because we, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, went we to, didn't drink right went yeah. to egypt and i just drank but, maybe like a beer or two yeah. right and yeah. that's it and yeah we, we we noticed that it's much less expensive to travel oh, gosh yes well yeah i mean because, it's a huge expense because i never drank one or two cocktails a day right i drank like it was an olympic sport yeah 
Yeah. And especially, I think it depends where you are and what part of the world you are, where just very generic drinks can be so expensive or what kind of establishment you are, where again, even like high quality drinks can be still very expensive just because you are like, maybe. But I mean, you also have the mindset where it's like, when the fuck am I coming back to city X, you know, or this country? So it's like, yeah, I'm going to have, I might have two or three more cocktails a night than I normally would because it's like, I'm probably never going to be in this bar again. That's right. You know, so like, let's sample as much as I can. You know, and that shit adds up. Yeah. But it's interesting what changes when you don't drink. Like when you when I don't drink, I go to bed earlier, for one thing, a lot earlier. I tend to get up early. Mm-hmm. You sleep better. Yeah, and then when I'm traveling, we get to see a lot of the city b- before it gets busy. Right. We're at a lot of things before they open, and it's because we're not out at night drinking right. and then tired and then sluggishly getting ready to make it. You know, b- before they close. Looking forward to the next drink. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Right. You know, I mean, it's like I was talking with my mom the other day. She was like, how have you been sleeping? She goes, was it hard to go to sleep? You know, I go when I first quit the first few weeks where it's like agony, like oh, going, really? trying to go to sleep. Yeah, because you would. It So it, it kind of you thought it was helping you, you know, because technically alcohol doesn't really help. You well, it's just well, like a logical it'll put, thing. It'll, right? you it'll get put you to, to like right. down, but, but you, you get less up. restful mm-hmm. sleep. Mm-hmm. Like the sleep that you do get isn't good sleep. So. But also you're in a different mental space versus what you get used to being in to go to sleep. Yeah, I mean, I definitely relate to like helping you to fall asleep. But then definitely at certain point that sugar is going to, you know, you was like, hey, give me more sugar. You know, wake up. (laughs) Where's my sugar? Right. And the quality of your sleep. It's a very, yeah, it's, it's, you don't get very restful sleep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you're drinking. So it took a couple of weeks to regulate that. And now I sleep like a fucking rock, like every night, like wake up feeling fantastic. I don't think the thought of waking up, even with a slight hangover right now, like terrifies me. Gosh, Yeah. And how it affects a whole next day. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in the same boat. When I go out now to, to, to drink or I'm having drinks with friends and I have my like one beer and I see people like kicking back cocktails, I don't even have a desire. Yeah. I just look at that and think I'm rolling the dice. Might have a great night, might be uh, having uh, indigestion. Yeah. I don't like having indigestion. Indigestion's horrible. You know, yeah. you're probably going to have a great night. Definitely going to have a shitty morning. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, I'm lucky in that I never really had a problem with hangovers. I tend to just consume alcohol like a like a fish. It does water? I didn't, oh, okay. So but, I didn't know fish drinks alcohol. Yeah, like fish do water. Yeah, mm-hmm. they like a, no, so, so, fish don't like alcohol. Actually, they they don't do well in no. pickles. So, do you miss the taste of wine? Yeah, I mean, I taste wine. It's my job. Okay, you, know? so you just don't. But like, yeah, I just have to spit everything out. But no, I mean, I I, I definitely miss like the social aspect like i miss having a glass of wine like some nights it's wild because i understand a lot better what my triggers are so Mm -hmm. if i have stressful day Mm -hmm. you know something you know fucks me off or whatever and it's just like you know that instinct to be like let me just grab a glass of wine or a beer you know i can really go for i could really go for it i'm like then you think about it for a minute and that moment passes and you're just like kind of breathe through it. You just like, okay, like I'm good. I don't need this. I can continue on. And there's a lot of great, like, uh, like non-alcoholic options now, you know, and those are only getting better. Um, so there's like NA wines and good NA beers now and NA, you know, spirits and Amaros and stuff that like oh. really scratch the itch. So, so it's like, you as a connoisseur of those things, you actually, well, feel like they're a pretty decent alternative, pretty decent to play. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, you know, the NA beer world's come a, a long way since mm-hmm. O'Doul's, you know. And... Yeah, you drink non-alcoholic beer. Yeah, well, beer to me, is, I think, is a little bit, because I actually really like the taste of beer, mm-hmm. like light beers. Uh, but with wine, it's just very hard for me. Like, I well, well, I also didn't really experiment with non-alcoholic wines, but yeah, they're... I'm a little bit afraid. Yeah, th- there's, you know... <laughs> one or two out there that are okay i think that that industry has a long way to come yeah, you know yeah. but even the na spirits like some of them are really they taste good like they're they're getting good on the taste but i feel like what a lot of them are missing are the mouth feel of a spirit mm-hmm. you know that viscosity you get that um a lot of them are just like 
flat and watery. You know, there's a good one. There's a great one called uh, Pathfinder, and it's a Maro. And uh, I don't, you wouldn't even know that it was not alcoholic. It like, hmm. for me personally, it ticks like all the boxes I think that I want. Man, planet. they'd probably even be better in cocktails with alcohol yeah. because I feel like using liqueurs is a generally a lot of low grade alcohol, and I can never figure out what makes expensive alcohol better. Yeah. And certain, I should say certain alcohol, because it's not always expensive. But, um, you know, like, for example, highly filtered. I know I know why filtration makes it cleaner. I get that part. Right. But I don't understand why, um, like, an expensive old whiskey will cause me less of a hangover than uh, a, 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 just a decent whiskey. When the only thing that it can get from age is more tannins and more of the things that would cause a hangover, more impurities, right? Yeah, um, you know, I mean, it, it's probably, you know, it's all going to be like how it's distilled as well, you know, how many, like, you know, how, how they treat it in the distillery. That's is, what I figured. So it's all going to come down to, you know, so the less time and energy they put into it, the... It starts with the product itself, right? There's things they don't divulge, I imagine, into what goes into their whiskeys that they're going to let run for like 25 years versus whiskeys that they're going to let run for like eight years. Right. And they don't say, oh yeah, we also use a substantially better juice for this other one. I imagine for right. marketing reasons. And, you know, I'm sure it comes down to, you know, the product that they're using to make the distillate out of as well, you know? Um, but yeah, Pathfinder, check it out. And they even like, uh, like on their Instagram and stuff, they they have cocktails with alcohol in it, you know, mm. and then they have like NA stuff too. But I like so that like NA. It's, yeah. yeah, it's super okay. versatile. Liqueurs and wines, I find on the and how I process the alcohol, it, it's not so good in general. Um, those are the things that really limit how much I can have in a drink. They have a high acidity, and they also have a lot of tannins. But I don't even know if that's what. And sugar. There's and, added sugar to a lot of it. Mm, so yeah. You know. The alcohol free versions I think might be better even in you know, even in like a Negroni and something mm. like that. Pathfinder, sponsor of the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So because um I kinda wanna transition and you sort of like planted a little bit of more seeds into the your the, your present, let's say field of interest. Mm. But uh, if I kinda close a little bit and summarize the hospitality in the form of a bar if someone wants or considers uh to open a bar here in jacksonville let's say what are the like definitely like first do this test to make sure you have less red flags before you even start thinking about like what they should be aware of i mean there are certain things that are like that are obvious but if because you have so much experience working at bars and open in your own ones of different, let's say, uh, forms. What unique advice? You yeah, it's you like have? just before I even start thinking, doing the layouts, you know, because we we'll all have like a sort of like flowery idea of what our passion is and what, mm -hmm. how it can be manifested. And then there is like a reality check. <laughs> yeah, which are two very, very different, yes. two very, very different things. Um, yeah, what are the reality checks? The reality checks are, you know, make sure you have a sound idea, right? And and you have a, a firm understanding of the industry, whatever industry you're getting into, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, you know, just because you're a good cook at home isn't going to make you a great chef. Right. And it's not going to make you a, a great restaurant tour just because you host fantastic dinner parties. You know, there's and why would be that? So because there's so much that goes into it. There's so much like like a you know, there's so much that happens in a restaurant that people just don't see mm -hmm. and will never be privy to until you work in one. Mm -hmm. You know, um, like what it takes, what it truly takes to make a restaurant or a, a bar operate on a daily basis is, I mean, it's so much more than the general public will ever see. You cooking a hundred meals is a lot different from cooking 10, I imagine. For sure. For sure. And it's, you know, it's, you're dealing with staff that doesn't show up. You're dealing with, you know, there's just so much 
you know, the dishwasher who didn't call and is not coming in, you know, it's like, you don't still want to wash dishes. Man. It's like, you're fucked. I mean, that's like probably one of the most integral positions in, in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. I think everybody should work that position, mm. you know, um, just to have respect for the person in that position, you know? So, um, because if they're not there, it, 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 it can end your day and put you in mm -hmm. you know, a bad place very, very quickly, you know, but, um, yeah, I mean, make sure you're, you know, you, you've got the right funds in place, make sure you've got the good concept or, you know, a well thought out concept, um, and, and find a good core team, you know, that, and that the you core can trust be... that, you know, you need a good GM, you need, you know, a good you know, someone to lead your, your kitchen staff, someone mm -hmm. to lead your floor staff, someone to lead your bar staff. Right. Um, and, or your beverage program and whatnot, but it's, you know, and, and make sure that they share the excitement for the concept, like, and, and that they truly understand what it is that you're trying to accomplish as a restaurateur, as a bar owner, you know, because if, if they don't, then, I mean, it's just, your message is never going to get across the bar. It's never going to get to right, the plate, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. So you need people who, who, who share that same enthusiasm and, and want, you know, at the end of the day, I think all we're trying to do as restaurateurs and bar owners is to make our neighborhoods and our cities better. Right. And I think that anybody, no matter what you're doing, no matter what industry you're in especially if you're dealing with the general public on a daily basis it's like we should be trying to make our neighborhoods and our cities better right? mm. our industry we do that through food and beverage so it's like you know we are we're trying to contribute to the growth of our neighborhood so you know providing jobs providing a place for people to go you know hopefully getting some recognition outside of the city so that people want to come to the city and like see jacksonville as a food and beverage destination. You know, there's no reason with as beautiful as the city is, with as large as the city is, with as many interesting neighborhoods as the city has, um, that we can't be a Savannah, a Charleston, you know, those mm -hmm. types of like small Southern food destination towns. Do you yeah. think Jacksonville is on the path or it's already there, like in the beginning, let's say all of that? No, they're on the path if they want it, you know, mm -hmm. but it takes more than just people opening restaurants like you need people in the city to actually give a shit and want to you know so you need your local government to care and 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 want to promote the city like that mm -hmm. i see i see what you know mean. yeah and if mm -hmm. they don't i mean it's fine like if, you think it's important to build up an urban core downtown or of you course. think it can be done community by community no i mean i i, I think every city needs a heartbeat you know every city needs a hub you know um so yeah I, I think the urban core is crucial um but it, it again it's like whatever you want the city to be look you want jacksonville to be a fucking sports team then we should be working hard to get every major sports that we can you know mm. in this town mm. and that's fine if you want us to be a food destination then let's do what we need to do as a city to do that you know if we want to be a business hub a finance hub great what i don't care mm. whatever it is but like Jacksonville has to pick a lane, you know. So. Yeah, and I felt like the geo, uh, like the 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 location and the topography of the of the city, uh, of Jacksonville, kind of has a, to me, a great factor to that, not uncertainty, but that undefined, like who am I, right? And because uh, there's this river that divides. We have beautiful bridges, but yeah. at the same time, they're two like significant parts, right? And sometimes we live in Riverside, crossing the bridge even though it takes to go to San Marco five to 10 minutes, depending on traffic, right. it's like, you're like, you live in the neighborhood, yeah. you know, you got, you got to prepare, you get in the car versus taking the bike. And I think, mm -hmm. and then you take the beaches, right? So I think geography, at least like, like anthropologists and me, I always think like geo geographical and your climate factor always factor in into what's happening with that local culture and mentality. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's also like, how the city has not moved people yeah. there's no public transportation there's no good bike paths there's no there's nothing 
you know, and they're working on, you know, the Emerald MR, Mile yeah. or whatever they're calling it, uh, which is great. But it's like, fuck, we need good public transportation. The city is massive. It's the largest city in the country land wise. Like, how mm -hmm. can you be the largest city and not have a way for people to get around? Our yeah. bus system sucks. Yeah. You know, there's no trains. There's no nothing. There's no way to move. Even in the urban core, there's no way for like, if I need mm -hmm. to go to Springfield, there's no way for me to get to Springfield. That, if I was to get on a bus, it would, I could probably walk the fucking Springfield from St. Marco <laughs> faster than I could take a fucking that's bus. True. Yeah. Like, that's insane. When we first came back to Jacksonville, we were like, oh, we'll just take a bus. And you helped us out. Yeah, we you didn't connected have a vehicle, us with uh, yeah. Kurt, who lent us Not a truck. Kurt, the, oh, Jeremy. I mean, Jeremy. Yeah, I'm sorry. You're, yeah. Yeah, you connected us to Jeremy, who lent us a vehicle. Because we were like, oh, we're going to try to take the bus. And it was torture. We were like, how does anyone do this? Well, like yeah. three hours to get anywhere. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You have to make two transfers. Like, it's like, there's no direct lines. Like, yeah, the the, the, the timetable is kind of suggestive. We were only going to be here for three months. Yeah. Well, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about what actually, like, uh, I'm very curious. Because it's a new, like a new, let's say, You want to the breath work, don't you? Is it okay? Yeah, Is it yeah. okay? Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> breath work. Yeah, breath work. Yeah. Well, I just, uh, yeah. yeah I, I just don't know how much you share this. And uh, to me, it was, um, I knew you were diving into different practices on mm. your own. But to me, it was a pleasant a new piece of information that you actually uh, got certified right in breath work so can you tell us about more like what kind of because there's like so much so many different modalities and techniques what kind of breath technique or method yeah so i did a course with a, a dutch gentleman named michael piker i think that's how you pronounce his last name and um you know his is very rooted in like ancient pranayama okay yeah like the traditional breathwork which i think is like how we should approach anything like even making cocktails i tell people i'm like if you don't understand the basics right if you don't understand the classics how can you possibly make mm. newer contemporary cocktails right if you don't if you can't make the classics right if you build a house you just don't throw it on fucking sand you know you have to put a foundation down <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it, you know, the certification is through that, but, you know, when I'm teaching, like we kind of like ramp up energy and, and build heat through, you know, we start with some slower breath work stuff and then move more into like, you know, Tumo or psychedelic breathing or, you know, things like that. Just, what is Tumo? Tumo is, uh. It is, I think it's like how do you spell it? T U M M O. Okay. Yeah, it's it, it's something that I'm just starting to kind of dabble into, but I believe it comes from Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, Not to be confused with Timu, that comes from China. Right. <laughs> but you know, like we we do a lot of like the psychedelic breathing, shamanic breathing, things like. Can that. you yeah. elaborate on that? Yeah. So those are like whereas like you know, pranayama is going to be a lot of like the slower mm -hmm. style breath. You know, the psychedelic breathing or this like big breaths and big exhales you know um mm. which you know can start to kind of put you in an altered state of mind um mm. and then i focus you know a lot on like extended breath retentions so mm. mm -hmm. you know we'll just get all the air out and hold that for mm -hmm. you know and we'll get up to like a three minute breath retention wow you know um which is a long time to, yeah. you know, not like you're holding day. your breath for three minutes. Well, you're holding no breath for three minutes, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, you exhale fully and mm -hmm. then, wow. yeah. Yeah, that's totally different from even inhaling and holding that. Right, right. Which, you know, we do sometimes as well. But, yeah, it's, uh, so it's been do, pretty neat. So you kind of build in your own uh, style or recipe, would you say? Yeah, just through different, you know, um, doing different things online and, 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 you know, obviously reading and, and getting, as I'm starting to get deeper and deeper into, um, the breath work space, um, you know, you're doing different classes or you find different teachers online that you like, and they have different styles right. and stuff. Yeah. So you kind of see mm -hmm. what fits and what doesn't, what works for you. Um, but I think it should always be rooted in, in ancient pranayama. I mean, it's like, so I'm not familiar with the shamanic or psychedelic uh, 
techniques of breathing. Like I'm quite familiar with the uh, ancient, uh, right. it's a yogic breath techniques. Uh, does the your approach or the modalities that you kind of trying to incorporate in your style and your own um, way, I guess, in your own recipe, do they also like in pranayama traditionally approach the breath not necessarily as like breathing technique but more um it's more like a layer of your being right it's not just anatomical breath in and out it's right. not it is a um it's almost like i guess the most simple would be energy so it's almost wow <laughs> yeah he's like I'm, I'm with you guys uh <laughs> yeah he's with, he's with somebody it's almost like you uh kind of dive into your less tangible your energetic layer it's yeah it's it's like a conscious thing right so i mean we breathe upwards of twenty thousand times a day how many breaths how many times out of that twenty thousand times do you actually think about i just took like a deeper breath right, right. but how many <laughs> times do you I literally never think about it? i can help it yeah, yeah you don't think if about i am it, thinking about it i'm usually i'm usually anxious you know it's like one of the things that we do that we don't ever think about but it happens all the time and it's like sustains like you stop breathing like you are going to die you know so it's like it sustains our life but it's like yeah i mean i you know um when i did my last class it was very much like i want us to take like start out with a couple of just big inhales and like big loud sighs and be conscious of what is coming in and filling up and what is mm -hmm. coming out and what are we releasing mm -hmm. on that um and then, you know, as we're doing the pranayama, like, it's like, yeah, be conscious about how that breath enters your body and how it makes you feel on mm -hmm. the way in, you know, and try to direct it into your body. Just don't breathe in and breathe out. Right. Right. Be conscious about what's coming into your body and feel that, you know, you feel the, the cold air come in and get warmed up in your body and come out as a warm, you know, breath. And, you know, you start to like make it's that ocean it's that you know that mm -hmm. revolving circle of mm -hmm. life you know that mm -hmm. is breath so. i like that peaceful and calm approach to it i've always been fascinated by it but from the martial arts perspective right because it ties into every aspect of martial arts as well sure um how you breathe and also even with um uh shooting with guns um your how you breathe is very important if you want to be a good marksman yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it's it's almost in every sport, you know, you're we're focused a lot on our breath. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a fairly sports is a good arena, thing, you know? also because you have all kinds of statistics, which I'm fascinated with. For me, I think because of growing up inside of um, a religion that I'm no longer uh, that I've changed my relationship with. It's, um, I'm always need, finding some scientific validation is always an important factor for me. Right. I don't think it is for everybody or that it needs to be. I recognize it as an aspect of my character to need to ghost bust everything. Um, but I like this because when I looked at into sports medicine and other arenas related to martial arts, I found it fascinating that you, I can basically summarize a lot of a lot of it by saying that we are collapsing a chaotic series of probabilities and our breath is how we can create the space to choose the right moment for what we really want in our life. Hmm. And that without it, without control of our breath, we're kind of neurotically bouncing from one thing to another with other factors controlling what's going on in our life. But if we control our breath, it's the beginning and the founda it's foundational to controlling what's going to happen next to you. Even in that tiny fraction of a moment of a, of a sporting event where whether you kick the ball slightly over here or over there, or whether you pull the trigger in this moment or a fraction of a second right. later is the difference of everything that's going to be statistically calculated or life and death yeah. in the case of martial arts. What do you think about that? Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think it's... You know, I think the breath plays a, a gigantic role in everything. I mean, as a martial artist, I mean, having control over your breath is 
it's huge when you're in the ring, you're sparring or you're fighting. It's Muay Thai. Muay Thai, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's crucial. I mean, if you lose control of your breath, you've lost your fight. You've lost, you know, you're definitely not going to hit your target. You're mm -hmm. not, you know. And in a fight, we see it. It's clear, pass, fail, win, right. lose. But in every moment of life, you don't necessarily see it. And where I feel like these sports and this and things like breath work are beneficial mm. is a lot of people, I think, go through life with their own set of facts, kind of restructuring things. Even if they had, say, a conversation afterwards, they'll be like, oh, that went like this because, you know, I think this. But in um, uh, with sports and with with sports, you learn to calculate what did and did not happen. And right. You, you, you kind of have work, like some record. You can, can, yeah, track. I guess what I want to ask... changes how you think about things that Sorry. play out. In life. This butterfly yeah. effect then plays out through every aspect. Of That's it. what I was more asking, not in relationship to sports or um, any kind of type of performance, but in general that through breath control, um, you sort of navigate or you collapse that probability that you are seeking for in your life. That's what you were saying, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah that's you kind of like not necessarily like dry, calculated, but it's like because it's very close to like manifesting, right? That is exactly yeah. what I'm talking about. I'm exactly talking that's about. That's what I meant. Like, what do you think about that? I mean, <laughs> no answer is an answer to. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know that I've ever thought about it like that. Would probably. Yeah. I yeah, but I was. It's great. She, she is thinking. No, about well, I actually was like, it's a. I have to say, I'm very reserved uh towards the term breath control because i find it very like rigid and it's always just like when i hear control i feel like i'm already like restricting everything right. mm -hmm. i don't want to control because it's said every control sounds to me uh as uh, something inorganic you know like opposed from exterior versus kind of but you feel that way even about the breath control that you do in yoga you do breathing exercises yes and, and then i think that's why i don't let, call it breath control i'm trying to like, like aware i guess like awareness maybe a softer way in and um i don't know yeah so I don't, you just don't like control can't it, can't abide yeah. the control uh, yeah the natural I don't know. Yeah. yeah yeah it makes total sense and uh, it's maybe the closest word to kind of deliver the message when you talk about it as breath control but it's just to me sounds energetically feels very like rigid and harsh uh, but it's just my feeling um so what brought you to that was it like just by ox uh, accident or it was by accident yeah it was through starting up a daily meditation practice is kind of where it all started and then through doing that i just um kind of started one day focusing on my breath mm -hmm. you know a little more um and as a way to i think just focus my mind you know right like yeah it's so hard sometimes when you're meditating and mind is running all over the place but it's like you can focus on the you know it gives me a point right and right then yeah. it's, that started making me feel a certain way and i was just like what is going on um so let me dive into this and see exactly what the fuck is happening inside of my body right now you know and yeah, that just kind of took me down a, a course, you know, um, and, you know, just started doing some research, started working on some different, you know, breathing practices, seeing what felt good, what didn't, what resonated with me, what didn't. Um, and of course, I mean, there's so much out there, especially, oh, yeah. I mean, right now, I think it's a very hot word in the mm. wellness community and stuff. So, um, I think it can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but, um, you know, whatever it means to somebody, I hope that it's just, you know, it's being used in a, a healing way for yourself, you know, in your practice. And, um, uh, you know, I know, I know that there's a difference in me. Like if I have skipped my practice in the morning, mm. you know, it's, uh, I can definitely tell like later on in the day. So, but I mean, it's still, you know, I'm still very 
early on in the practice and and stuff so it's you know but i love it and feels like it's causing a direction a shift in your life for sure and just to retouch on the tumo stuff i think i misspoke i believe it's like a tibetan monk breathing and it's like tumo tumo yeah and it was like a way for them to like breathe very slowly but generate a ton of heat so like they could go basically sit in their underwear in the snow and you would see like the snow would melt around them and it would like because their body temperature would get so hot is this similar to the wim hof method it's kind of where yeah it's like what he studied Mm. i think yeah Mm. yeah the guy who climbed everest with in his shorts yeah it's insane and he didn't make it all the way to the top but he made it really far and did still it's insane how far he went in his shorts like no climbing gear (laughs) just i don't even know yeah i wouldn't even go outside (laughs) <laughs> like, I don't like to be yeah. cold. Yeah, well, so, I don't think he, he just like woke up one day and decided. No, no, yeah. no. He, he practiced and <laughs> he studied. He built up yeah, to this point. That's all yeah. breathing. I mean, yeah, no, he's a, yeah, I mean, he's he, he's a master yeah. of right. that style of breath work. So it's customary uh, in podcasts to, uh, p- to, to leave people with, I'd say, something where you'd like to direct them next. We're going to, of course, leave a link to Bar Molino, your mm. current uh, uh, project, and Sidecar, uh, the, uh, your, your previous project. But where do you, where do you want to, what, what would you like to maybe, um, what, yeah. where would you like to direct people? What are you into now that you want people to maybe follow you on if they are interested in uh, following along with your recent interests um you know i mean i don't post to social media nearly as much as i used to so i mean i think the 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 restaurant's probably the best place to focus that um and if someone wants to practice with you or experience your breath work technique oh yeah i mean you can follow my my personal um is it more instagram Instagram? yeah okay do you have like a place of practice I think now? K R D U B three three is what my okay. handle well, is. I yeah, think. you gotta. Yeah, um, we'll have to buy it together. To make people sure. have me all the time. I'm like, I'm not quite sure. I don't, you know, I don't ever look for myself. myself. Yeah. yeah. So um, we could put a link down below. Yeah. But so. yeah, so I mean, the when I did the class a few weeks ago, it was at Vive, you know, um, which is great because they're um, they're awesome and they're right next door to Bar Molino, so it makes it really easy. Um, so, so would it be possible to find the announcements for your next class on there maybe uh, social i don't know probably probably my personal um, personal is the yeah because okay. i don't know that i've opened it up to the public just yet you know okay as we were talking before uh we got started on the podcast you know it's it's first and foremost a personal practice and i mm-hmm. think it's just a way for me to kind of you know give back to my community a little bit so um you know when i did the last one we just had like a handful of teachers and you know i invited a few friends and stuff and we did it's very small and i see i see okay. so chill, you but... don't want to yet open it so if someone let's say like oh i want to try kurt's method like, right you gotta wait yeah okay got you yeah. all right so but i don't know i mean i'm, I'm still trying to figure it all out man <laughs> i definitely want to make because i was planning to come to yeah. the last one but it just the it was the great yeah, yeah it was really beautiful that's what yeah. i hear mm-hmm. yeah i'm looking forward to trying it yeah yeah, so, yeah yeah maybe yeah maybe we can talk about you you also giving Always. a class to uh my uh practice yeah yeah it's a Happy small to. yeah and you most likely will know most of the people cool so it kind yeah. of be a friendly too. and vive where you held it they were also on the show um we had um alejandro uh, oh, nice. and dan yeah, and dan both. also mm-hmm. uh, which we know totally independently we um we each you mean independent them. from Kurt or independent yeah, independent oh, from oh, yeah, although yeah. we all know each other we all met each other totally independent right right yeah. we didn't well, all meet at one time or place yeah they're great they've been fantastic neighbors and you know can't really yeah they're just so sweet um and so supportive you know like they also i think come at it from a very you know community oriented neighborhood you know hey we're trying to do better in the in the neighborhood so i just really respect that all of you guys create something by making something good you don't make it by making something and then trying to do it as uh, cheaply as possible and then advertising as much as possible you make right. it by trying to make it good itself mm. 
and I just find that um, a, a, a quality that you can bring success to the table with, but less often nowadays. People yeah. now tend to rely more on just advertising blasts and, and very low-grade communication, I feel like. And I'm, I'm really glad to see the, uh, the community that's built, the longevity, the, the fact that it's a different approach to a market, mm. but that this is still how you can cultivate a strong and, and good market and a good community and long-term relationships with that community and other business owners as well. I think, it, yeah, I think a lot of it comes down to consistency. Like consistency should be at the core of mm. everything. You know, be consistently good, be consistently bad. I don't care. Just be consistent, you know. Um, so, you know, be consistently kind to others. And, you know, it's, I don't know. So, yeah, consistency should be at the core of everything. And that's, I think when we're opening restaurants, we're opening bars, we're opening businesses, like that word should be like mm -hmm. on the yeah. fucking cornerstone. Like, you know, be consistent or be nothing. Isn't it what people want in a world that's chaotic, in a world where everything's changing and moving around? If you find something that's consistent, then it, it feels like um, it, it feels like hope and home. Well, yeah, I guess like uh, the the model, the human part, the very like human part in us is looking for that stability, comfort, consistency, and balance. But it's a very elusive term. It's yeah. basically and nothing definitely. in the world is like balanced and right. stable and comfortable, right? Otherwise, it like, yeah, like the most comfortable thing is death. <laughs> I like how Ram Dass said, "Oh, death is very safe." <laughs> I just love this. You know? It's like taking off an old shoe. <laughs> anyway, this is a very first morbid. Pod, first first podcast to ever plug death. <laughs> I'm more from our sponsor. Yeah, great. Try it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Professional, professionally, when professional performance only, do not try it at home. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So thanks so, for tuning yeah. in. If you're in uh, Jacksonville uh, and you're not trying death, go to Bar Molina. <laughs> um, Eat and, great uh, food and taste good wine. Yeah, that's right. Uh, thanks for uh, coming back, Kurt. We'll I have to have you on again when you want to talk about the uh, maybe more about breath work and about ayahuasca. I'm always uh, down to talk about these yeah, factors yeah. for sure. And I know Alexandra has a lot of uh, questions related to these ephemeral practices. Okay. Yeah. No, do, am <laughs> I'll I, take true that. or false? <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to come back anytime. So thanks for having me. Thank well, you. Always a pleasure. Yeah. yeah. So let's go to lunch. I'll turn this thing. Let's. Off. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in. See you next week. Okay. Where would you like to? What's your palate is calling for?